Hello, everybody. Um, this morning um, or any other time uh, you are located in currently globally, uh, this is uh, the widest uh, stretch we have nominally. We had another guest from Australia, but uh, Deb Verhoeven was actually located in Canada, if I remember rightly. So this is the longest stretch we go so far in the Kudan Open Lab seminar event series. Uh, we have uh, John Hartley, who joins us from Western Australia, um, on one on the one hand, and Indrik Ibrus, who joins us basically mm -hmm. from down the road. Um, and both of them co-present today. Um, they have written a book together with Maria Oma, Oyama uh, on the digital semiosphere, culture, media, and science for the Anthropocene. Um, that is basically uh, an inaugural book talk. Um, but there is more exciting stuff going on. Uh, so we will also hear a little bit from Indrik about the Cultural Science Journal, which we uh, um, did a friendly takeover from Chan. <laughs> um, and so that is a rather very interesting, exciting thing, because the question was always like, how do we call whatever we do, uh, digital humanities, humanities computing, uh, systematic science of art and culture, cultural analytics, cultural culture analytics, cultural analysis, cultural data analytics, whatever. So the key thing is we are now sort of like uh, in, a, in a regime where we call it both cultural data analytics and cultural science. And there is the cultural science journal, which I find very nice because my own lab was called the cultural science lab coming from a different <laughs> direction in Texas. And so um, there is, uh, as we solve the naming game of how this is all called, um, there is definitely a lot of uh, action going on and we try to be a venue for what the tradition from John's side is uh, and that crowd and the cultural analytics crowd and complexity science dealing with culture, social science dealing with culture and so on. So that is a really interesting kind of novel development, which we also go into today. The focus is on the book, but um, we will also sort of do a pre-announcement of sort of the more concerted announcement of that. And the other thing is I need to say thank you to both uh, John Hartley and Indrik because uh, Indrik uh, sort of co-conceptualized uh, the Kudan original the original Kudan proposal which brought me here and which I'm you know now leading the research group um, but that would probably not have been possible without the pioneering work of John which uh, goes uh, a little back a little further um, and so this is indeed a very important presentation because it gives you sort of the vision of um, two pioneers in this area. So with that, I just hand over the stage and the next two hours um, is yours. And um, Indra Garchan, whoever wants to start, um, stage is yours. Yeah, hello, I will start. I will do a few um, uh, quick introductory uh, words. So John asked me to tell the story of how we actually all got together. And uh, you have a kind of nice slide about that, John, maybe you proceed. So my own brief story is I was a young man uh, disappointed in postmodern theory and uh, who then realized that um, Yuri Lotman's theory can provide us a perhaps a more sort of holistic picture, systematic picture of how and why media and culture evolve. And then I started to sort of put these things together at the London School of Economics where I did my PhD and then realized there that this work has been already ongoing in Australia in Queensland University of Technology where uh, John was uh, pushing uh, towards this. So um, how we got together uh, with John, the answer is very easy. John became the uh, opponent, the reviewer of my PhD thesis. So, um, and of course, uh, he, has been, he has been advising uh, me uh, since then, and we have been collaborating since then. But uh, also, I would like to point out that uh, uh, after my PhD, I started working on, um, on cross and transmediality issues. And there was an up and coming PhD student in Tartu University, the very home of. Uh, uh, of culture semiotics called Maria Oyama. And so we um, started uh, collaborating with her as well. And eventually in 2017, 
uh, we all kind of realize that perhaps it's time to really make a proper push and uh, write a book uh, about how and why is it good to use cultural semiotics uh, as integrated with other approaches, especially uh, John, John's cultural science approach uh, to make a proper push and prove the world that this is valuable, worthwhile, and media and cultural studies especially should be, you know, start considering more of using uh, the Lotman's core ideas that provide us means to think about cultural change, media change much more holistically than perhaps uh, it has been done. So, uh, and yeah, here you see the picture of our of the first day of our meeting when we started uh, thinking about the book and next to it are sort of the grand heroes, Sarah Mintz and Yuri Lotman, where they were still young. Um, and this is the sort of the, the, the crowd. This is our crowd now. <laughs> and then this is the crowd that, that we will be talking about. So um, that was the uh, early backstory. We started work in 2017. Now it's four years later, we have the book, it's here, and this is what we're gonna talk about today. But I will give the floor now to uh, John. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Indrek, that's terrific. Um, uh, and I was just um, glad to be able to put up that photograph of um, one of our beaches here at Fremantle where we spent a little bit of time when you came over to talk about the book. Uh, not least because it's a 35 day today and um, that's where I should be right now, I guess, but uh, that can wait. So we move on and uh, I want to talk about uh, one of the reasons or some of the reasons how we got from uh, the uh, work that I was doing previously in media studies, cultural studies, communication studies and creative industries to this idea of cultural science and uh, data analytics, uh, analytics or cultural analytics. And the first thing I want to uh, touch on or, or identify as a, as a kind of starting point is that when I was working with um, Jason Potts, who's an evolutionary economist, uh, about, uh, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago now, uh, we were trying to come up with a kind of economic theory of creativity or creative industries uh, such that e economists would start taking notice of creativity in ways that they hadn't before. And one of the places where Potts and I came together in, in the reading that we had done, which was very di but divergent otherwise, was Torstein Veblen. And uh, Veblen wrote a, a, a very influential article in 1898 called Why is Economics Not an Evolutionary Science? And uh, that's still a very compelling article. I recommend it to you. But it got me thinking, why is cultural studies not an evolutionary science? And the more that you start thinking along those lines, the more you worry that the study of culture along the lines in which it has been established in the Anglo-American tradition, uh, the more you worry about uh, whether that's adequate to the tasks that face us right now. And so uh, uh, the, the, the very beginning of this journey was to, to try and understand uh, culture in relation to evolution, but not to simply borrow the apparatus that was already in place from the psychological and behavioral sciences around the evolution of culture, a lot of which was completely inadequate and based on dreadful premises, uh, which I won't go into right now. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, the, the ground was not occupied by uh, any theory of, of uh, cultural evolution that uh, struck me as being compelling when one's own interest might be in culture, power, meaning, relationship, identity, and so on. Uh, so this is what got me to Lotman. Uh, I was already familiar with um, uh, the, the structure of the artistic text uh, from my days as a structuralist and post-structuralist media studies person. And uh, this book, The Universe of the, Universe of the Mind, uh, was a, a revelation, not because it said anything, well, it did say things newly, but uh, not because of some new um, a discovery that Lotman had made, but because he was able in that very late book to show that 
uh, there can be systems and evolutionary sciences based in natural language, based in what we have previously understood to be the humanities and the arts and culture. So uh, that's, that's the kind of germ of, of what got me here anyway. But at the same time, during the same period, and it's a period that's been lasting maybe a, a generation now, uh, we, are, we have been observing the collapse of the humanities, culture, the arts, uh, uh, and um, creativity more generally in uh, the domains of public policy and uh, competitive business, if I can put it that way. Uh, you know, just as the period when um, uh, uh, media were shifting from broadcast to internet and um, interactive forms uh, just at that very moment the, the kind of global corporatization of media companies turned uh, us not towards a kind of user-based uh, cultural creativity as one might have hoped <laughs> uh, but towards um, uh, an internet of shopping and the corporatization of global media as we all know so I wanted to find a way to address government policy and business in relation to their economic power uh, by avoiding competitive individual behavioralism and the obsession that they have with celebrity technology and corporate freedoms, uh, as opposed to the kind of farming of consumers that um, uh, is prevalent there, uh, to, to, to develop a model for um, uh, for uh, uh, cultural exchange or cultural creativity uh, based on the systems and evolutionary sciences that I've discussed already. So rather than taking um, uh, culture as an evolutionary system uh, from uh, computer sciences, behavioral sciences and psychology, psychological sciences, I wanted to take that same issue, that same proposal, proposition from the cultural sciences, hence the name. And so the question becomes, how do you synthesize the theoretical approaches of someone like Lotman with the practicalities of uh, media, culture, communication, and creative policy and power as currently exercised? And so that's what brings us to this. Um, with Jason Potts, I started the proposals around cultural science. Uh, in a book that came out a long time ago now, 2014, where we decided that if we we're going to talk about a cultural science, it shouldn't be um, one that, uh, that um, uh, what shall I say, it, it shouldn't be one that uh, um, used Darwin as a metaphor, but actually tried to be a properly Darwinian uh, evolutionary proposition. And so that's what that book tries to do. Uh, not necessarily completely successfully because uh, neither, neither Jason nor I used the book to do more than uh, what uh, Karl Popper calls bold conjecture, their kind of essayistic approaches to a science of culture rather than a performance of a science of culture. For that, we have to move forward a bit, I think, in, in skills and progress. Uh, so that was the first one. The second one was a book that I brought out on my own at the beginning of last year called How We Use Stories and Why That Matters which is yet more essays on the uh, possibilities and applications of a systems and um, evolutionary approach to uh, some of the more familiar domains of cultural and media texts that we, we come across so often. An attempt to prove to my own um, fields uh, who are very skeptical indeed about uh, evolutionary and scientific approaches to culture uh, that something is possible in that area. And that brings us finally to the book that we've just uh, published, which has been complete for a while now. It takes a while to get these things launched, but uh, working with Maria and Indrek, it's possible to uh, take seriously every level of uh, the Lotman model of um, cultural semiotics, not just the textual level of individual works or individual um, cultures, and not just the kind of institutional context within which um, such things are produced and consumed, as in media studies, 
and not just the kind of global or population-wide dimension beloved of the uh, behavioral and um, uh, evolutionary sciences, but all three. Uh, and so this book is an attempt to demonstrate that at micro, at meso, and at macro levels, uh, one can study culture uh, through systems and um, evolutionary lenses, as long as one takes seriously what Lotman has been trying to do. And luckily for me, uh, I'm not a Lotman scholar, uh, but both Maria and um, Indrek are much better tutored in that domain than I am we were able, I think, to come up with some pretty original um, approaches, which I hope we can take you through right now. So we're going to move between three domains, three layers, culture, media, and science, which is the subtitle of the book, uh, via Maria, um, Indrek, and John. Uh, <coughs> uh, and the three levels are the micro, meso, and macro. This is a, se a sequence that you might not recognize immediately but it's actually quite an important um, innovation in economic theory. Economics traditionally has two poles, that is microeconomics and macroeconomics. And the institutional or um, uh, evolutionary economists, Jason Potts prominent among them, proposed quite early on with uh, Kurt Dopfer, uh, who's a Swiss evolutionary economist, that there should be an intermediate in, uh, level called the meso uh, mesoeconomics and that's that we've taken that uh, insight forward in this context too. Culture, institution, system, text, media, semiosphere. So we're trying to find ways to not only widen the lens but also keep these different kinds of sphere uh, together and be able to do the thing that Lotman was so very good at which is to look at things as general systems but also in very micro and minute detail. Uh, and so that is our prospectus for today's um, uh, proceedings. And I think it's now my turn to uh, pass across to Maria to take over on her section. Sure. It became blurry for me, but does everybody else see? Yes, we can see sharply. Very good. <laughs> Uh, anyhow, hello from me as well. Um, so maybe to start, actually, I, I, it's easy to admit that uh, text might seem like a counterintuitive concept when we're talking about the contemporary online communications at a time when we need to account for not only human but also computer agencies uh, in this general diversification of uh, creative, uh, receptive, um, curatorial, distributed, distributive practices, mm. and also all the more so uh, during the time or in the era of the Anthropocene, where we need to find vocabularies for uh, for taking into account uh, interdependencies or making sense of the interdependencies between the human cultural sphere and the spheres of other life forms. But still, uh, we believe uh, the notion of text still serves us, and for reasons uh, we'll get to in a minute. Uh, so first, what is a text? Um, what text is about? It's a term coined to create analyzability of diverse phenomena in culture. And Lotman proposed that uh, a text, there are three characteristics of a text, it displays three main characteristics. Uh, that you can see here as well. It's first, it's expressed through a sign system, which can be verbal, visual, etc. It's bounded by, for example, a compositional frame, beginning and ending, a web domain, etc. And it's structured, which means that there are hierarchical relations between its compositional uh, elements. So. The concept itself is neutral in relation to any particular signifying system, even the Lotman's own interest, as we know, was in literature. So we can textualize basically any communicational object in order to render it empirically analyzable. So including, for example, a YouTube video, a single video, or a YouTube channel as a whole, 
as well as the whole YouTube platform as a textual totality, which in this case may be expressed as a specific combination of audiovisual, visual, and verbal sign systems. And this uh, universality of this concept has also um, has allowed us to um, step towards explicating this overlap mechanism of uh, human cultural life and uh, organic life. So namely in dialogue with uh, Thomas Seberg's proposal that the definition of life may coincide with the definition of semiosis. Then uh, Estonian Otatu Pajad Semetishun Kalevi Kull has proposed and developed the notion that organisms function as self-reading texts. So it's argued that uh, the Lotmanian terminology is also suited for the description of isomorphisms, which is basically structural similarities between biological and cultural phenomena. Uh, but a bit more about this side uh, in the book. I'm not going into details right now. And anyhow, the, the main merit of this uh, conceptualization is not broadening of the do semiotic domain, so to speak. It's not about determining self-contained cultural phenomena as an end in itself. But uh, the main merit, we might say, is a new understanding of text semiotic functions. And interestingly, uh, Lotman attributes similar functions to the text, but also to intelligence or thinking mechanism, as he says, also to a semiotic system in general and to language. And this seeming incompatibility is not a result of an unsystematic approach, but namely in his view of these structural and functional isomorphisms uh, between different cultural phenomena. So Lotman links individual thinking mind, artistic texts and culture and semiosphere and claims that these function uh, basically in a very similar manner. So, and the key functions of a text in culture would be then first an obvious one, probably transmission of existing information. That's what this information theory has been focused uh, mostly, right? Transmission, adequate transmission of existing information. But then what Gottman was more interested in were the functions of creativity, so creation of new information, which cannot be deduced uh, algorithmically from the existing information. And thirdly, preservation of previous information or from previous textual communication. And these functions, of course, are distinguishable only analytically and in actual practice, they do overlap and intertwine. And which one of these dominates in every given instance depends on the reader mostly and the reader's dialogue with the text. So for example, if we take um, a painting, let's say painting by Van Gogh, uh, it simultaneously, it transmits information about the late uh, 19th century France and Netherlands. It also creates new information when it's interrelated. Let's say painting is in a digital database. It creates new information when it's juxtaposed with other paintings in the database and also within the remix culture, the digital remix culture. And it's also a recorder of visual cultural continuities that underlie uh, formation of European identity. So depending on what interest, which aspect interests us most, it can serve these three functions. So understanding the text as a structure is therefore balanced by understanding it as a process. And the ontology of this process is conditioned by its dialogue with the extra textual. So yeah, thank you, John. <laughs> you, uh, took me uh, right where I need to be. So let's see, just very shortly again, I can answer questions later, but also you can give a, get a more detailed view in the book about each of these functions, uh, but a word or two, or two about each. So first when discussing this functional transmission, uh, there's an important uh, specification that needs to be made in relation to this expression uh, aspect, uh, namely 
I refer to this uh, somewhat misleading notion that the text is expressed in a language, uh, in this his definition. So in fact, the cultural semiotic view holds that the text must be, must be at least dually coded. Any text is bilingual, at least, or realized in the space of, at minimum, two semiotic systems. So a simple example. A novel is a text first in a written verbal language, but it's also a text in the language of literature. So your command of English language does not automatically bring along an understanding of any novel written in, in English, right? Uh, or let's take a YouTube video. It's a message in an audiovisual language, but it's also overcoded by the codifying system of YouTube. So there are, which determines the length of video, the ratio, positioning in relation to other videos, interactive features, etc. And any text's meaning generating potential derives from this uh, such multiple overcodings. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, we can get, go a step ahead and claim that in general, this idea of a possibility of a single idea language to serve as an optimal mechanism for making sense of the world around us is an illusion. And this illusion should rather be replaced by an image of a structure uh, that is equipped with uh, a minimum or two, rather with an open number of diverse meta languages, languages of description, each of which is reciprocally dependent on the other because each of them is incapable of expressing the world, the extra textual reality independently. So for mirroring the reality, we need to do it from different angles. And this attaches to culture, the characteristic of stereoscopy in Lotman's uh, works. Uh, so Lotman proposed that the evolution of these modeling systems or these languages of description is headed towards growing individuality. So uh, in complex societies, more and more specialized languages emerge uh, in response to this perceived gap between the extra textual reality and these uh, textual models of reality which appear insufficient. And this uh, specialization, in turn, uh, complicates mutual understanding and shared identities among speakers and users. And as a result, uh, what's happening now, we're witnessing the generation of grammars, unified description, uh, development of artificial meta-languages, standardized and interoperable metadata schemas, for aggregate platforms, uh, etc. These practices become commonplace and they're designed to balance this environment of communication, extremely diverse, and insert a sense of universality into it. Okay, so another uh, central characteristic, we might say, of digital communication, which complicates analysis, is this what we might call. Uh, the growing elusiveness of textual boundaries. So Indrek mentioned, for example, the cross and transmedia practices. This is one aspect of this problem. Uh, also, one thing is uh, the rise of the paratexts, you might say, uh, the subtexts that are simultaneously different from the core text, but also part of it. We might, uh, as an example, trailers for movies. Before a movie enters the culture, it's preceded by a trailer. And a similar thing happens also for books growingly. Uh, and we, for example, have a web page for uh, our book, the address of which you'll probably see uh, at some place. And there's a huge pair of this um, marketing paratext, we might say, which step into dialogue and direct the interpretation of the core text. And drawing a line between these paratext and the core text becomes more and more difficult. And yet another aspect is this practice of including all sorts of text, videos, images, uh, movies, songs, etc., into this infinite flow curated by recommendation algorithms, but also into lists created and collections created by humans. 
And these collections might include text from very different historical epochs, very different discourses, media, etc. And as from this, let's say, former and established ways of organizing culture, these collections might seem as an archival mess, but and not a systematic whole. But what has been happening in the digital semisphere, let's say, is the multiplication of alternative holes. So there are not this one established way of creating uh, holistic collections and some sort of textual material, but there's a growing rise of alternative holes. And in such collections, the whole determines the meaning of an individual text and not vice versa. That's why they're important. And members of the Tartu Moscow School uh, the Tartu Moscow School is the cultural semiotic school that Yuri Lotna founded. In their thesis about the semiotic study of, of culture published in 1972, they referred to this problem um, that on different levels, the same message may appear as a text, part of a text or an entire set of texts, which is a good way of describing uh, the current problem as well. And later Lotman also uh, generalized this claim to uh, in semiospheric terms as well to apply to the semiosphere as a whole. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, mm, and within such, um, uh, I get to creation uh, at once. So, which, within such part whole dynamics, we may state that in culture. The text is never exhausted within its material limits and to generalize to semiospheric terms, the extra semiospheric is as if already written into the existence of the semiosphere itself. So the extra semiospheric is the source of evolution of the system and the source of creation of new uh, meanings uh, within it, which does take us to this creative function of text as well. Uh, it has been explained by the current Tartu members that the, for Lotman, the cybernetic meta language was a common language uh, for treating extremely dissimilar cultural material in a homogeneous manner, or creating, it was instrumental for creating a holistic theory of culture. But at the same time, the cybernetic meta language is not very well equipped for explaining the creation of new information within texts, especially artistic texts, right? So that's why he had to come up with something new. And uh, what he was most interested in was namely, as we know this artistic text where what could be regarded as noise and error from this point of view of adequate transmission is actually a source of valuable and new information. And that's which gives us way for modeling, also creative modeling of the external uh, world or reality. And the mechanism of uh, creation for Lotman uh, lies on the mechanism or, or is based on, the, on translation. So he claims the elementary act of thinking is also translation. And we have in mind here a process that is similar to Roman Jakobson's, if you know his Jakobson's concept of intersemiotic translation. So this, this happens between two languages or two semiotic systems, uh, which uh, in which the elements are different and the syntagmatic logic and rules are different. So the source and target language are differently structured. And there is a lack of exact equivalence between these languages. So if you think of, let's say, verbal and visual language, that's a good example. And uh, this lack of equivalent elements uh, necessitates uh, or causes the need for choice in the process of translation. And that is, choice is what re renders them uh, creative. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, the most uh, creative areas of the semiosphere as a whole lie close to the periphery or to the border zones. 
And these are the less described and incomplete areas that may be represented by only some fragments of a language or individual texts, separate texts which might start to act as catalysts in the whole mechanism of the semiosphere. And one simple instance of this, uh, such a process or such a, a mechanism is the journey of the word selfie and the practice of selfie from a peripheral Australian, peripheral from the point of view of, let's say, global semiosphere, peripheral semi uh, Australian online forum to the state of ubiquity, you might say everybody's taking selfies these days. And uh, similar thing has happened to video blogging, et cetera, et cetera. So these such examples confirm us that the source of creativity, source of this creative function is not located in individual property or individual authors, but it's located in this group forming culture. And as referred before, the texts in culture emerge from a dialogue of intextual and extratextual levels. And the extratextual context that is all the times changing uh, determines which are currently the most important elements within any given text. So we take, I don't know, Mona Lisa, the elements that we uh, see there as important elements that we attach into or insert into intertextual links are decisively different from the ones that this uh, 16th century viewers uh, noticed and entered into networks or interpretive networks. And similar things are happening with, I don't know, monuments around us, but let's say feminist and ecological readings of fairy tales and other canonical texts. And so consequently, we might also say that Lotman conceptualized the reader's activity as a dialogue with the text and not as a decoding or deciphering of a text that Stuart Hall's works, for example, make us think. As creative so reading is not the linear and exhaustive consumption of a text, uh, but in this sense, every text is also a meaning generating mechanism, meaning generation mechanism. And artistic texts have an explosive potential in this. Okay, now very shortly also about perhaps the memory function. John, if you could uh, switch it. Uh, now the Semiosphere model, which is uh, some authors claim actually based on Lotman's understanding of text or very organically grew out of this concept of text. The semiosphere model is usually viewed as a spatial model, but its spatial dimensions are very importantly accompanied also by a diachronic dimension. So Semiosphere has a complex memory system, uh, which allows for explaining also the coherence and continuities of culture. So, and culture and memory, as we see from this often repeated definition also, they are functionally uniform in Lotman's and also Uspensky's treatment of culture. So culture is the non-hereditary memory of the community. Although this definition also has uh, people who don't agree with it. Let it be just to stress this uh, importance of memory, not only importance, but this defining aspect of memory and culture. And one of the keys here is understanding memory as constant recreation instead of preservation. And this does allow us to explain how cultures and its components maintain their identity throughout creative transformations as well. So culture's memory is not a stable container or stable storehouse, but it's more accurately understood as a mechanism of variation. And this uh, compressed repository of meanings contained in a cultural text is realized in contacts with other texts and new uh, contexts or extra textual again. 
and uh, an example of this process is uh, why we perceive that, for example, the canonical literature, literature that is considered important for certain cultures, it never stays only in verbal written format. But at one point in time, literature, canonical literature, becomes also audiovisual, or at least is illustrated uh, by images. This is because culture is constantly looking for ways to describe them as part of its current living status. And as we know, today's culture is decisively visual. So to make sense of the past and its identity forming texts in accordance with the contemporary meta languages and modeling systems in order to preserve one's identity. And for example, this translation of verbal text into audiovisual text or visual ones into virtual reality ones are simultaneously also not just textual communication, but it's also auto communication. So it's culture's way of making sense of itself, self communication or self description. And so in some uh, texts in the semiosphere are the first means for making sense of the external reality, but also for making sense of oneself, us as individuals, but also us as culture. Yeah, but now on to the next level of making sense of things, and this is uh, by Indrak. Yeah, so um, hello again. And um, yes, in some sense, we can say that um, what, we, what I'm going to now talk about, the meso level or the media industry level, this is in a way something that Lotman originally didn't do. So we, we can also say that this tripartite division of the whole semisphere into, into these three parts, yes, and also the middle part where we discuss the industry operation and how industries organize text, but I also, but I also conditioned by text. And the industries then are also conditioned by the largest sphere of culture that, that Lotman calls the semi-sphere or the system of culture. Um, this is what I'm gonna talk about now, how the meso level both frames text, is conditioned by the text, but is also conditioned or shaped by the broader, needs to accommodate into, adapt into the broader cultural uh, sphere. So what we are, what matter here are these interdependencies there between the uh, levels and uh, what the, the term that uh, Mari already was using was one of the central concepts for Lotman originally was the mm. isomorphic uh, relationship in culture. So mm. one cannot exist without the other level. One level cannot exist without the other levels um, and are structurally similar. So this example that we also bring in the book that you can reconstruct the whole kind of structural setup of a of a ancient culture based on only some of the uh, you know, fractions, elements of, of it. So this means that this refers to this possibility of analyzing the, that the relationships matter and you can analyze the other level through the elements of in one because there are these isomorphic relationships in a culture. But um, Maria ended her talk with uh, referring to the auto communication concept also absolutely central in Lotman's theory um, and I will start with it. Um, in the sort of middle part of the book, we, we use, uh, among other things, uh, we use these strange metaphors, bubbles, blows, uh, foam, uh, globe. We, something we kind of um, borrowed from uh, uh, Peter Sloterdijk. We were inspired by him. Uh, but at the same time, we need to emphasize it is not, our system is not exactly uh, the, the same how, how he was using it. But okay, back to the auto communication concept. So as Maria was already saying, um, culture, one, and what is special in, for Lotman, different from most other communication scholars, uh, is that Lotman emphasized this concept, this function of auto-communication. Various communities uh, producing communications about themselves, self-describing themselves, how they are distinct, distinct, distinct from the rest of their culture, rest of the society. Uh, and Rodman says that 
any community, any structure uh, uh, in, a, in a society does this. They produce self descriptions to, to understand themselves, uh, to generate themselves. Um, hum in human societies, we do this by various kinds of these days, we do this by various kinds of marketing texts, various kinds of regulatory documents. Uh, we do it in a way every day when we talk about us as these things, as this thing from others. Uh, and when it comes to how sort of media industry kind of evolves, then um, uh, the question is um, sort of the process of when auto communication takes over. And of course, in, in a way, it starts from the beginning, but, uh, but there is a moment where um, auto communications kind of start, start fixing a, a, a media domain. Let's say some, uh, uh, to bring an example, uh, augmented reality, something we also talk about in the book, this kind of this emergent media domain. It's very quickly evolving these days. And, um, and so they are experimenting a lot, They're trying, to, trying, trying to find new forms, new forms of expression, trying to figure out how this medium could, um, could work. And in the process, they start producing auto communications texts that define the best ways, uh, and we are defining the best ways, the appropriate ways they get fixed. And so the prediction is that let's say in 10 years, we know what augmented reality is. It is fixed also by the textual matters, matter this domain has produced about itself. And uh, what matters, mattered originally to Lotman and what mattered to also to us um, is this, uh, this question of, um, what, how does this, in a way, work in digital culture? We, sh we show that this auto-communicative fixing has always, hap has always happened. Uh, but of course, the digital culture is special um, uh, as it kind of has these various technological layers to do that. You know, we call it metadata layers. Uh, but effectively, what, what digital culture, digital semi is very special, is this how this textual matter, this textual mass, uh, are, are fixing that sort of te technological design and vice versa, that the no technological uh, way of being fixes the text to a certain um, evolutionary path, uh, if I may. So uh, this is what we also discuss in the books, this how this kind of te technology and culture and textual matter lock each other in. And we link back to various kinds of innovation um, studies domain concepts such as path dependencies, technological lock-ins, and also techno-economic paradigms, uh, which is a, you know, one of the central concepts in, uh, in evolutionary and institutional economics. Uh, typically understood as um, that uh, uh, when there's an economic crisis, uh, industries have a chance to sort of figure out, the, focus on a new kind of new, new technology, and then you know technological innovation takes off until the markets and the industries has kind of taken off everything from that technology. Then is what, what follows is another economic crisis where the where the markets and the industries can sort of find another technology based on which to sort of facilitate growth. Um, but we kind of argue that what we also need to look at in these processes are this: what happens before the new growth phase? how uh, innovations uh, are kind of culturally facilitated, um, how we arrive at new potential technologies via kind of gradually uh, accumulating technological cho choices, uh, micro companies or, or people finding the way as being relating to each other's work. So we trace this kind of evolutionary paths, evolution, the trajectory is kind of in a way more holistically looking at how culture drives what kind of technologies are picked up uh, and used by, by the industries. And we also look at the other, you know, another, other familiar um, concepts such as network effects that we all know facilitate uh, sort of um, in, a, in a digital culture, the uh, digital era, sort of the dominance of, of big platform these days because for each of us as, as consumers, it is useful to be part of a larger networks. Um, but in the, from the Lotmanian perspective, perspective, this can also be seen as this 
broader system of culture auto communication, how we join sort of more systems that are stronger, that auto communicate more effectively, uh, and then fix the culture more effectively. It is economic in a way to join each one of us, uh, these bigger systems. But then in the book, we also say that in some other sense, it may not be economic at all because new value innovation are not actually created in these um, homogeneous systems that are created by strongly, effectively auto-communicating communi systems. So, and this is why we advance to the to another metaphor uh, called the blows, uh, that we call the blows. So from bubbles, we arrived at blows, so the bubbles need to be blown um, uh, diamond again. And to explain this, we need to um, arrive at another uh, central uh, concept in Lothmanian uh, semiotics, which is the dichotomy of center and periphery. So um, center in a society or culture are these units, these subsystems that, um, that have power in a way. And the power comes from their auto-communicative ability. Uh, they have the means, they have the ways to auto-communicate communicate effectively, set the rules for themselves, as well as the broader ecosystem where they operate in. Um, but the problem with, uh, with, the, with the course and their power is the, and their auto-communication is that there's, there's an unavoidable danger that by codifying everything they do, they get too much fixed. They lose their dynamic abilities. And therefore, culture also, also always need or does have uh, its peripheries. Peripheries are, to be said simply, and here we also kind of advance uh, from original Lotmanian spatial thinking that peripheries simply are something away from the, from the core, that are literally in the periphery. Um, but in a digital culture, where is the periphery? Uh, what, is, what is really a way? So what we define it in the book as, as, as subsystems in culture that don't have that sort of auto-communicative power or maybe even the auto-communicative, strong auto-communicative interest. So periphery are the subsystem, smaller subsystem in periphery between different cultures in a way that have the readiness to absorb their environment to bring in new ideas, to, to combine these ideas so that to react to the constantly changing cultural or maybe technological uh, milieu. And of course, when they sort of come up then with the sort of appropriate solution that kind of is responding productively to that changed milieu, then it's possible that culture picks that up as a useful solution, useful set of meanings, useful set of technologies and start using this. And then there's always the potential that the periphery becomes kind of grows into the new course, a startup that uh, you know redefines, reshapes our, our whole of our uh, digital semiosphere in a way. Um, and uh, and this is this also is another way how Lotmanian theory enables to to understand and conceptual change how this is happening. Um, so, and, and therefore we, in the book, we also kind of in, in some sense normatively say that um, instead of neoclassical, so neoclassical neo economics is the kind of dominant form of um, economic theory that they teach in the business schools, for which change is always a kind of exo exogenous shock. Innovation comes as a manna from heaven from all of a sudden and disrupts the system. Uh, but we are saying that, no, no, we, you need to look at periphery also as part of the system, um, uh, sort of expand the system and, and to understand all semiotic dialogues, translations that bring about change. Um, and so in, in, when it comes to that, so expanding the system means developing endogenous view of, of, of cultural systems, bringing everything in, in a way. Um, and, uh, and we also, when it comes to kind of, in, in a way, normative discussion, then we refer to also uh, Lucy King's concept of interpretive strategi strategizing in media companies, where they need to bring in people with different kinds of expertise, different kinds of uh, knowledge, so that to 
be able to introduce new ideas into sort of fixated uh, organizations. So the argument is that for, for evolutionary change, so that, so that change doesn't become revolutionary, but is, it, is indeed evolutionary, uh, it is important that bubbles in a way are built up in a way that dialogues are enabled, new information can enter them, um, and so uh, systems can react to the environment in a way organically. Okay, John, can you can take us to the next uh, slide? Um, of course, and then we um, take a sort of another level up when it comes to review. We describe in the book how um, how the system or the sort of semiosphere or the contemporary digital semiosphere that con 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 that comes together from um, bigger companies, smaller companies, different kinds of agents, uh, how we need to start looking at as a kind of this bubbly foam that consists of bigger companies, as I was saying, the kind of auto-communicatively auto -communicative, auto effective, but also uh, smaller companies in different national semispheres that all are in dialogue uh, with each other. They auto-communicate, auto but they also are in dialogue uh, with each other using various kinds of, they may use it for dialogue various kinds of codes or communicative ways. Um, as uh, Maria was saying, any text can be, or, or is unavoidably is coded in multiple ways. So also any social or cultural organization in this similar, based on a similar principle, is part of various kinds of language or code systems in, in the culture. And therefore, they exchange ideas in sort of multimodal way unavoidably. Um, we bring in the various concepts from, um, from um, again, innovation studies. We uh, bring in the concept of uh, Ben Oke Lundvals, which is who is the Danish innovation scholar, his concept of interactive learning, how, uh, how especially smaller companies are kind of learning gradually from each other and sort of how this kind of swarm of companies or the foam of companies kind of evolve over time via this mutual interactive learning processes. Uh, then also uh, Jason Potts, uh, together with John Hartley, Stuart Cunningham and Paul Olmerod, uh, developed this concept of social network markets, how communication and sort of cultural meaning systems um, uh, facilitate our understanding what matters in culture. So it's and what is popular, what needs to be consumed. So our consumption decisions are not made by price as neoclassical economic theory is saying, but let's say communicative activities around these cultural services and products, and also cultural meaning systems that organize ourselves around these products. So we need to start looking at communication processes and culture as kind of coordinating thriving mechanisms that drive, uh, drive markets and shape technologies. So in, you can also very, perhaps to put it bluntly and sim simplistically, our, our theory is culture constructivist. We see culture as, as a driving uh, system that you know, organizes people into groups and these groups then are making knowledge, inventing technologies and sort of making economy to happen. Um, and then we theorize also how the concepts such as mediatization bring about how cultural industries start collaborating increasingly with, with other industries. So when other industries are increasingly structured similarly as, as uh, creative industries, they, this means in temporary, contemporary times that they're getting smaller, uh, um, uh, increasingly, uh, et cetera. Um, um, and uh, and yeah, so what we also emphasize in the book is that, uh, and this, uh, these ideas come again from the innovation systems theory, is that it, the foam, so to speak, the foam of productive institutional agents need to have different kinds of institutions in them, including public service media, for instance, in the cultural media context, because different kinds of companies have different kinds of goals. They work towards different goals. And if they do that, they introduce kind of distinctive different ideas into the broader semiosphere, which means that the whole system becomes more, or let's say less risk averse, 
and, and kind of increase the diversity of ideas towards which the whole kind of societies and systems can um, uh, evolve towards, which simply provides more alternatives, uh, uh, more possibilities for intersystem dialogues, which again mean, mean makes whole system more ready to address all risks, all problems that we may face, and we do face them in the era of the Anthropocene. So, uh, um, John, can we proceed? Um, and then briefly, we, when it comes to the media and culture industries, we discuss also how this all happens on the international level. Uh, media economics is such that it relies on the economies of scope and scale logic, meaning that it's always beneficial for media companies to grow big and international uh, uh, operate internationally, and this is what they do. Um, but uh, uh, borrowing from lots, we introduce sort of another uh, set of concepts here that facilitate how well the media companies can actually develop their international strategies. And this concept from Lotman is the sending and receiving cultures. And again, this is built on Lotman's kind of basing on the information theory that cultures evolve cyclically uh, where they are. There are stages where they are more ready to absorb new information. Let's say Eastern Europe, Estonia, uh, in the early 90s, they were hungry for new ideas. They brought everything in. Yeah. Um, and but at some point, this kind of um, flow in of new ideas becomes too much. Culture uh, needs time to digest all of that new stuff in a way. And then closures happen. And maybe we see this also kind of right now in Estonia that we are, um, uh, we become a bit more reluct reluctant when it comes to um, ideas from, from outside. Uh, but Lotman also shows how this via this digesting function that you bring new, new ideas, new forms, new meaning systems in, you intermix them with what you have, and then you might have something unique at hand that might be of interest to everybody else in the world. And we showed uh, in the book how this also is happening. Um, let's just say, uh, we, 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 brought, we brought a range of examples, but let's say, let's think about you know, Scan Scandinavian um, audiovisual industries, how all of a sudden they had kind of remixed the um, ideas of, the, of the, the creamy, their own book, literary creamy series uh, and, you know, learning tricks of trade when it comes to um, audiovisual industry operations. And all of a sudden what followed was what we all now know as the Nordic Noir, the very special kind of uh, television uh, genres. So um, we, we show how this is happening, how the, how the receiving cultures in a way could become sending cultures. And then in the book, we also show that, um, well, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, the whole world was concerned about the, so to speak, uh, Americanization of culture. There were, we, you, you could argue that it was unidirectional flows. Then in a way of, of, because of kind of realization that you need to build this strongly autocommunicative local systems where you make different kinds of subcultures to meet and uh, productive units such as different kinds of companies to collaborate with each other, you can arrive at this kind of system in your culture that is able to um, be, you know, be function as a sending culture. So we, in the book, we theorize the sort of everything around K-pop in, in South Korea. Uh, we talk, we discuss uh, Nollywood, Bollywood, um, and as I was already mentioning, Danish film industry. Um, and we show how this multiplication of culture flows globally has started to happen. And this, this kind of diversification is happening in the digital semiosphere. But we also show how there is also kind of counter tendencies. What is now, now known as the balkanization of the internet in a way that not only there is an increasingly European internet based on its own regulations, there is American, there is a Chinese, and there may be also Russian. Um, and this, you know, we all know the sort of geopolitical reasons behind that, but also uh, you, from the Lotmanian perspective, you can, you can theorize this 
as a kind of closure, normal, normal phase of closure when a system has had enough of, its, of openness to the world of ingestion of ideas. Um, so effectively, what we, when we talked about media industries uh, as kind of meso level framing systems um, in the semiosphere, then we brought in that it's actually originally the concept came from uh, Bakhtin, the centrifugal and centripetal systems. So uh, there is, um, um, there are, there are counter processes. One is kind of increasing, bulk, uh, increasing multiplication, increasing diversification, um, because systems need to generate more meanings as, as, as uh, because it's beneficial for them. They want to explain the world, the extra, extra textual reality, as, as Mario was saying. But at the same time, at some point, the diversity is too much and the cultures need to strive towards more of homogenization. Um, and you know, these two movements, two forces are kind of conditioning each other. Both are happening at the same time towards more of descriptive languages, explanatory languages, but then also homogenization because human cultures cannot operate without something being the same. Um, and this kind of, when dis dis discussing this global media industry dynamics, this is where we sort of ended and what followed was the sort of description or explanation of the broader semiospheric dynamic where semiosphere interacts with other planetary systems. And this is, uh, is going to be explained now by, by uh, John. Thanks, Indrek, and thanks also, Maria, for your uh, contribution earlier. I think um, uh, it's just it's just really important to um, make sure that you understand that the um, the rather free floating ideas that uh, may come from me and the rest of this presentation are based on a very solid scholarly foundation provided by co my co-authors who know what they're talking about. Um, but I want to take the idea of the digital semiosphere, the digital part of the digital semiosphere, and the sphere part of the sem dig digital semiosphere uh, to the place where we all now live, which is a much more global, much more technological, much more uh, interrelated um, semiosphere, uh, with all of that apparatus that we've erected uh, in place so that we can try and understand things. And this is uh, not just a matter of trying to describe the world more adequately through a better formal language. It's also saying that the formal languages that are currently hegemonic uh, in politics and economics are not suitable to the task. And the proof of that pudding is the state of the world that we're currently living in, as we all know. So uh, the need is for interdisciplinary reform, not simply to improve one particular method, but to bring uh, a full intellectual apparatus to bear on uh, the opening and uh, indeterminate uncertainties of the current era, knowing what we know, uh, but also seriously the contribution of culture to the economic and political domain. So that's what cultural science is trying to achieve, not to achieve a kind of methodological silo effect of its own, but to join in conversations that are interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, post-disciplinary, or even anti-disciplinary. Uh, and uh, I think the, the kind of the chief problem that we have been working with, although it may be under quite uh, considerable critique now, is the kind of behavioral individualism of the economic and political uh, sciences up until this point, uh, where you know the the um, the, the object of uh, or the or the agent of ec economic activity is what uh, Torsten Veblen calls the uh, self um, I can't remember self something self centered self motivated um, globule of desire uh, the want the motivation and the desire of the individual uh, without thinking well what constitutes an individual how do they get made what are they a product of uh, and so um, this is what we're trying to trying to understand. So where are we now? Uh, we have talked about the need for whole systems to be uh, understood as the generator of individual texts, individual persons, and individual institutional frameworks. We have talked about how uh, 
translation is right at the heart of uh, uh, cultural uh, um, uh, productivity and that uh, you must have at least two systems uh, in order to uh, create meaning. And in that context, uh, we come up with the notion of staged conflict as the arena within which the groups that culture makes, the identity groups, the understanding groups, the language groups, the culture groups that uh, culture makes, uh, come into contact with others. And it's in that contact where the we function is uh, um, not simply um, surrounded by a kind of neutral other, but is opposed by an antagonistic other with whom we are in competition, uh, the we they function then. Uh, where this becomes productive of new knowledge, ideas, technologies, and the rest. So uh, we, we, we are living in a world where, uh, although we see ourselves globally, digitally, and uh, uh, in terms of the planetary impact of our activities as a human species, uh, we're not able to act as a, uh, as a human species, partly because of individualism and partly because of staged conflict, where uh, what we're uh, what we're able to do in terms of uh, both individual and collective action is constrained by the groups that we belong to, whether they be cultures or nations or whether they be economics or um, science or whether they be politics or um, uh, fantasy. It's quite hard to tell them apart these days. So there is an issue about uh, the relationship between the whole and the part that I think cultural studies and cultural science needs to think through very carefully, uh, not least in its own uh, ways of doing things. Because cultural studies has sought over the last 40, 50 years to understand where cultural conflict over asymmetrical power relationships is occurring and then take the side of the underdog in that conflict. Uh, and I, I come from that tradition uh, where I, when I started the, uh, uh, the organizing principle was uh, adversarial classes, then adversarial genders, then adversarial races, then adversarial uh, sexualities, and so on and so forth to where we are today with intersectionality. Well, that's good. It's necessary. And we have to understand that the diversity that people are uh, uh, protective of is, uh, is uh, real and um, uh, a necessary part of, it in, in, of individual identity. We also need to understand a larger externality to that, which is that we're messing up the planet. So we come to users. Uh, and in that context, I think we're at a new stage in um, cultural evolution, a stage where for the first time there are users out there in the world who don't know any other world, but one in which all of humanity is one group. And so this is the first self-made global digital class. And that class is mostly inhabited by children uh, who are the TikTok generation, as it were, the, the users of uh, digital media, not as technology, but as culture, as expressions for themselves and of themselves. So, uh, the TikTok generation is producing a kind of class consciousness, uh, 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 among other things, lots of other things too, uh, uh, producing a kind of class consciousness at global scale about global issues, as well as um, taking selfies and producing self-expression around music videos. Uh, and the obvious uh, example of that is Greta Thunberg uh, and the Fridays for Future school strike for climate uh, movement which is entirely based in social media couldn't exist without it and has had a transformational effect on national politics and international politics in various forums uh, in, and it's also almost entirely girl-led uh, in different countries and in different ways uh, on different um, principles but nevertheless what we're observing is that the global semiosphere the global digital semiosphere is creating a kind of form of knowledge around its own mediation, uh, which is being child-led, girl-led, and uh, is devoted not to, um, as it were, sectoral issues, but to the impact of our species on the planet as a whole. And meanwhile, at the same time, 
uh, uh, technology seems to have broken free of the intentions of its producers, uh, such that um, uh, Carsten Hermann Pillard, who is a German evolutionary economist, sinologist, and cultural scientist, uh, thinks that the, techno uh, the technosphere should be regarded as an, uh, as an autonomous stratum, as it were, in the geosphere. And uh, I think that's an area where we need to um, uh, um, take cultural science to, to study more carefully how technology uh, is not a fix, like blockchain is a fix for everything at the moment, uh, but, an, but an autonomous stratum with its own evolutionary logics and its own impact on the uh, geosphere. Uh, the obvious example of technology in this context then, not being a thing that one owns, but things like cities and transport systems and um, you know, linear information traveling through the Suez Canal or not, as the case may be, that sort of thing. So the question in relation to technology then is not how do I own it? How do I exploit it? How do I make it fix the problems that we've already got? But how can it be regulated as an autonomous system? And we go back then to Kalevi Kuhl's notion that um, uh, uh, semiosis may be the basis of life and suggests that um, the, um, uh, the, the, the answer to that question about how to regulate uh, various global systems is uh, to understand the processes of semiosis much more carefully. Okay, uh, now in that context, we have to go back to the idea of text, the idea of semiotics, the idea of semiosis, which in most places other than in this present company is understood as being simply about um, language or literary text or uh, just words, as I put it here. And uh, here I break free from the book. This is not uh, stuff in the book. You don't even know who Scott Morrison is and nor should you. Uh, he's, a, he's a disreputable uh, marketing executive who's become a politician and is now the Prime Minister of Australia, uh, for good or ill. Um, and um, one of the problems that he faces is that um, he's uh, proven, his track record has proven to be very heavy on uh, rhetoric and very light on delivery of solutions. And the same thing applies to School Strike for Climate, where Greta Thunberg just last week was um, posting this cartoon by uh, an American cartoonist called Andy Singer, where uh, the, um, the evils of technological modernism uh, around the world are just being rebadged and retitled and let, hey presto, you know, problem solved. And I think what I'm trying to say here is that in both cases, in both politics and in the economy, uh, and in, uh, um, what shall I say, uh, cultural disputation of various kinds, it's really important to understand that semiotics is not a kind of rhetorical layer that's applied to a situation that already exists in its own essence before we get there, but is in fact the producer of that uh, system that we're observing. So semiotics is not a, a, um, an epiphenomenon, as they used to say. Uh, it's, uh, it's not... Uh, uh, illusory or um, uh, um, uh, I can't remember all the various words that are, are used to downplay uh, the process of communication, meaning making and, uh, and so on in the social sciences and uh, natural sciences where we, where we don't have a high reputation um, for uh, realism as it were, but nevertheless uh, we should be making a claim much more profoundly that uh, politics and economics are dependent upon how they're understood and by whom, uh, according to what uh, political and cultural um, uh, determinations. Uh, and this is, uh, this is, as it were, the use of cultural science once we get it right. And I say instead of understanding semiosis as uh, just words, we should understand it as world building. And world building is a term that I've taken from uh, a guy called Alex McDowell, who's a, uh, in that sphere, very well-known um, creative director and narrative designer, he used to be called production design uh, in Hollywood. You can see some of his credits there, films that uh, you may or may not have noticed, the, the uh, uh, amazing creativity of his work. Uh, but he has tried to theorize what it is that a production designer does when 
what he's creating is not a character in a movie, not a narrative in a movie, and not uh, the uh, kind of uh, trajectory of the uh, narrative arc, but the look and the, and, the, and the environment, the universe within which the action can make sense, such that that look becomes a kind of character in itself. And he's produced this idea of word, world building uh, from what, what he wouldn't call, but I call from the umwelt out into the, uh, into the, out into the world uh, through various diagrams, which you can see on his websites. Uh, and um, the, the idea here then is that we need to understand the selves, the texts, the systems, the institutions that we are trying to um, observe in this larger context where they are all in the play of you know, spheres and um, bubbles and foams uh, that uh, they don't control. Uh, a, a much more profound model of sense making and reality building uh, than uh, I think we've inherited from the linear sciences. And so where are we heading? Well, that's the question the book ends with. Uh, we've been talking about culture, we've been talking about words and meaning and signs, but uh, where's the planet heading? And uh, I think the answer for uh, cultural science must not be, well, it's you know, heading to hell in a handcart, uh, but what can be done to use our understanding of semiospheric um, uh, pr processes to regulate the semiosphere, the digital semiosphere and the technosphere, uh, such that it, uh, these, these uh, functionalities can become uh, sustainable poised systems rather than uh, the catastrophic uh, impact systems that we currently have. And the, the alternative has been um, offered to us just in the last week by a group of scientists who published uh, article in Frontiers of Conservation Science, uh, saying that uh, if we don't plan to avoid a ghastly future, then we will have one. And it needs system change, not, uh, not um, individual bits of change, uh, is the slogan. And it's one where I think we are, we are kind of aligning with the kind of protest um, and um, activist uh, traditions of cultural media and communication studies. And to say, well, yes, those traditions are incredibly important right now, but at a global digital and, te and uh, technosphere uh, level. So uh, we need to fix the semiosphere rather than fix um, technologies or the narratives of particular political institutions. And here, I don't think I can do better than to uh, mentioned that uh, uh, our book is illustrated by an Estonian artist called Peter Loritz, who I'm sure you know better than I do. Uh, and these are some of the um, illustrations that uh, take us through from uh, the kind of textual and institutional level to the global level and um, indicate that uh, all is not well uh, downstream from where we're currently standing. That's it. Nice, thank you very much. <laughs> this was a very long, but very thorough and very awesome um, summary. Um, so this book will, and I hope the audience will agree with me, very much become a point of reference that is seminal. Um, so first let's applaud the speakers. So I, I see hands going up um, everywhere. Um, and it's always the Zoom uh, awkwardness to not hear it, but I'm pretty sure everybody's impressed um, and, and likes us a lot. Um, there is a, there's a number of things we, obviously there's plenty of stuff to discuss and um, this is something which will probably occupy us for the coming years. So whatever we discuss right now will be partial and uh, sort of idiosyncratic, but we should do, do nevertheless. Um, I would like to um, preface the discussion with something that is uh, rather interesting, which is also one of the reasons I'm here. So when I was hired, when most of the group was not here, um, one of the interesting things that percolated out of the discussions between the people that were hiring me and, uh, and myself was that there is really a kind of um, compatibility going on 
uh, between the theory um, in cultural science um, or cultural analytics uh, developed here in Estonia, rooted in Lotman, um, and uh, basically where I was coming from, which is um, um, has two different roots. One is um, classical, cultural, what, what in German is called uh, Kunst und Kulturwissenschaft, meaning object and uh, and material based uh, sort of study, art history, architectural history, archaeology. Um, and at the other hand, by looking at larger kind of amounts of this network science and complexity science. And so it turns out that this kind of uh, more practical materials based notion is rooted in very similar roots as uh, what Lotman talks about here. And so um, I, I could easily fill a whole review paper of going point by point, and maybe this is something we should do, um, how this um, theory that is laid out in this book is actually also paralleled by, uh, by scholarship that actually deals with particular phenomena in a mathematical sense, in a quantification sense. Um, and so, but there is another interesting thing. This is not to say to diminish what the what the what this whole value of this book is. No, no, no. Quite the contrary. This is a um, sort of one could almost say a kind of Rosetta Stone of the theoretical world of cultural studies to this kind of more empirical thing of like how do we deal? For example, let me give you just one example, which is filter bubbles. Filter bubbles have been recognized, we all are aware uh, um, uh, of them, in, they come out of complexity science, they have been realized as things that in a dynamic system, there is these bubbles emerging. And for example, we know one thing that is uh, connected to it, which is the wisdom of crowds. If you ask independent people about like, you know, what's the hate of, uh, I don't know, Annapurna, uh, you will, the average will get pretty close. Uh, but if all the people belong to filter bubble and they already, like one person says a number, the whole group will be biased towards that number. And so the presence or non-presence of filter bubbles tells you if the wisdom of crowds breaks down or not, which, for example, gives you the idea that democracy in a situation where there is only two filter bubbles that are fully shortcut cannot work because the wisdom of crowd breaks down. So this is at the same time a sentence I can only say because there is theory like Lotman's, so everybody can understand it, while at the same time there is quantification and mathematical modeling that actually makes us able to say such a statement. And there is a, there is a, um, a field where similar things have happened, which is systems biology, where you have qualitative researchers and quantitative researchers, theory, and at the same time, um, looking at the numbers, observing nature, but also observing what mathematics can do, like numerical modeling without ever reading a book without ever looking at nature. All these things need to go together. And in this whole game, that's uh, the possibility space of cultural data analytics, the theory, I have never, and so I say this, um, this is my direct impression from this talk, I've never heard such a comprehensive kind of summary of all these things, how they actually fit well together. And of course, this is not, you know, like just like Yuri Lotman is not uh, Jesus and uh, the Bible. This is maybe not the Bible. So you should not cite it, John Hartley and uh, uh, Indrik and Maria said, and therefore, but the key thing is this- We don't quite, mind if they do, that'd be fine actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this provides pointers towards that. And so there is lots of things which we can see in Lotman, which are pre-science because he has looked at all these different things similar to say, Luhmann has looked at a different range of, 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 of people. Kassir was aware of science and uh, philosophy and culture. And so what we now need to do, we also need to recognize we're living in a very different age. We live in an age where there's more data produced per minute than probably has been written down all the way to 1973. So whatever Yuri Lotman wrote in 1973 is cool and good, but now we need cultural data analytics because we actually need to check if that's what's happening, uh, right? So we need to figure out, okay, so there is a new meso, for example, which is epigenetics. So there's a thing between gene memes where you can actually really store information and then they're inherited or a cultural non-hereditary 
memory where you just say, okay, this is a nose, but it's basically all different atoms than seven years ago, but it's still stable. It's like a limit cycle, whatever. So, so we're, we're, we're happy that it's still there. But there's an in-between thing where indeed, if I have a piece of paper like this and whatever I write on this piece of paper is sort of meme-like, but meme gene-like, but not a meme gene, because you know, obviously if somebody finds this and doesn't have what I have in my head, you don't understand what I wrote down, for example. There is a mixture going on. And so there is, all I wanna say with this kind of monologue is there is a kind of ski area that opens up in front of us. And you can use this book like a map to the ski area, but it doesn't govern exactly how you ski. There's lots of things you can do and bring in. And so this will be a book that will be highly cited and there will be lots of things, but I hope that what we do here and what goes on in the next 20 years will lead to a situation that will truly revolutionize our understanding, where we will then see Lotman as a pioneer, where we see whoever does what we do right now as pioneering maybe, but there will be lots of stuff where it's like, how could they think that? Because <laughs> we have actually seen the data. That is sort of the key crucial new element that we actually take the feedback loop of saying, okay, let's, let's really look at the data. It's not true because Sloterdijk has said, Sloterdijk may have a good intuition, but based on the data, it looks like this and that. And so that's like, I think the way forward. And so the question is exactly where are the, so then logical questions would, for example, be to the group. And this is almost like a panel discussion question I would like to uh, pose to the authors. Where do you see uncertainties, holes, or, or already saying, okay, there's things which we said based on the information we have now but what are the most pressing challenges where we should poke into this uh, edifice and actually make sure that this is how we understand it correctly? Because that's no, there, as you said at the end, it's not a light issue, right? We almost need something like a round corporation for culture because right now culture is under attack, society is under attack, the planet is under attack. And I'm not saying this, no, we did some errors. It's actually literally under adversarial attack by people that, sort of want to use the exploitation of data to act for their own benefit. And so we can see this, this is not just Russia versus blah, blah, blah. There is also corporations and companies doing stuff like that. So, so the question would be, where do you see, where do you think whatever you have summarized in this is the stuff that needs the most research in the near future? Humanity seeing itself as a unit. Okay. Um, nice. Cool. Cool. So I can, uh, as a quick comment from me is that we actually did write uh, an article after the book that is still kind of under, under the review, where we uh, also discuss uh, these potentialities, how to study um, uh, study the sort of the global semiosphere using the means of uh, we can call it cultural analytics, um, but not only just study it, but kind of forecast. Um, in a way that provides the global societies in a way in the form of public value. We use that term also in that article um, that could kind of give the, in the same way as weather is forecast. So the global societies cultures, they know more or less what's about to come in terms of, you know, stage conflict or cultural conflicts or that, what's, what's coming. And so that we can take this, this into account when it comes to their uh, own operations. Of course, this is a very, very kind of early stage idea, but at least we theorize this kind of potentiality. But maybe uh, join you reflect in this context, your, uh, your whole idea of, uh, of, of, uh, of cultural science and uh, where did that kind of emerge out of that integrating the um, integrating the cultural theoretics so if uh, complexity science and uh, other evolutionary biosciences and what's the purpose in a way um, I, I think it's to answer your question it's a matter of looking back at other sciences in, in the atmospheric sciences are exactly the right place to go uh, in the 19th century the idea that you could forecast the weather was uh, simply ludicrous people laughed uh, and thought it could never be done. Well, people think it now is impossible to uh, understand culture in the same way as a kind of global system, which nevertheless has much 
local turbulence and uncertainty. Uh, and the, the problem is we haven't tried to forecast and to understand local turbulence in relation to global systems in, in the cultural domain. And that's why I'm trying to say in this presentation today that I think the, the problem, the biggest problem facing us is how do, we, how do we, the species, think of ourselves in relation to uh, global uh, systems uh, as, a, as a single species, uh, one planet, one species, uh, rather than as a bunch of, um, you know, argumentative uh, primates uh, who are simply trying to grab the biggest uh, pineapple for themselves. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's much, much bigger than that, but it will also take much longer to sort something through that becomes the kind of cultural science that Max was just describing. Uh, he says 20 years, I think more like 100, uh, but 100 years isn't very long. It's, uh, I mean, mm. I'm 70, so I've done most of them already, and uh, things, have changed, <laughs> things have changed a bit since... Uh, uh, I first um, step, set foot on this planet, but also they haven't. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think we need to think longer term. We need to think in 50 year units. Uh, and the climate scientists have shown us that, it, that that is necessary. Uh, the atmospheric sci scientists are the people who've been the pioneers in saying, look, we need to fix our culture because something's going horribly wrong here. Uh, and that's the direction we should be pursuing. And by the way, it's 15 year old girls who are leading the way on that initiative and we need to be listening to them too. So this isn't just a, a, a question for, you know, tenured scientists. This is a question for the populations of the planet in their huge diversity and uh, uncertain positions for themselves. Because there's, you know, there's, uh, they, as they say, they have nothing to lose but their features. Sorry. Uh, anybody else? Ah, uh, Maria, you wanna you wanna give your answer? Nice. Sorry. Actually, I just second to both Inter and John. This whole idea of cultural forecasting is this place that I'm also most interested. In what can become of it, and what not? What are the boundaries? possible forecasting also given that uh, Lotman's concept of unpredict unpredictability <laughs> of culture the book has also been published in uh, Tallinn University Press unpredictable mechanisms no culture but this whole idea of culture forecasting definitely is I believe novel and worth looking into more detail Thank you very much. There is there's a problematic term which um, in complexity science was mentioned in this circumstance, which is the issue of nudging. So it has been proposed to do cultural forecasting, but the problem is that stuff is not funded if it's community, like future ICT has not been funded, but future ICT is done for the profit of the few who can afford to do it. So yeah. there is a very interesting kind of subsect, but I don't want to monopolize the discussion. Uh, actually, please, everybody, uh, ask your questions and put it in the chat, ideally, um, and then I will address, I, I will take them one by one. Mila raised her hand first. Could I type in or, or can I ask? No, you can just say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. It was, you know, highly thought-provoking uh, discussion and um, and I really can't wait to read your book. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. But there is one, one thing. Um, that in a way makes me uneasy. Um, I'm, I'm a cultural historian. And to me, uh, to use the concept of cultural evolution is, um, is kind of like very new. Um, and to me, it implies that there is kind of like certain kind of development, like Hegelian type of development of culture. Uh, you mentioned this uh, at the beginning of your, your talk briefly, that this is probably not exactly what you are meaning, but I would like to hear more kind of like, what do you mean by, by cultural evolution in, and why did you choose the, to use this concept here? Cultural evolution, uh, if it's properly Darwinian, has no notion of development towards some kind of supposed uh, perfection. because evolution is completely blind 
and entirely determined by circumstances. Uh, and so I think we've misunderstood evolution, frankly, if we think that evolution is a, is a kind of pyramid upon the apex of which sits this singing ape that doesn't know uh, its own mind. I think, the, uh, I think the, the whole point of cultural evolution is for us to understand cultural history in relation to larger systems, including natural systems and other animals, including uh, the ones that we are causing to go extinct. Uh, with, a, with a very strong understanding that we ourselves are just as likely to go extinct as any other animal should circumstances change, which they quite clearly are, uh, not only in climate terms, but in other ways as well. So I think the, uh, I think the, the kind of, um, you know, the kind of fisticuffs between cultural evolution understood as social Darwinism and the evolutionary sciences understood as the biosciences now do needs to come to a, a better accommodation. And one way of doing that is to take more account of prehistory and uh, artifactual history, the sort of thing that uh, it, um, Max was uh, talking about, where we are learning a great deal more about, for example, the Neolithic and the invention of farming and how human societies were organized before that uh, than we knew at the time when Darwin was uh, um, producing his theory. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've grown up with an understanding of the Neolithic revolution as the invention of agriculture and then productivity and then, you know, modern life as we know it. But it's perfectly clear that most of the things that uh, have been claimed for the Neolithic revolution preceded it, uh, including uh, the world's first stone structures, uh, for example, in Gobekli Tepe in, in Turkey where there are incredibly sophisticated stone circles which express some kind of uh, communal uh, message, some kind of mass, mass communication system of the day uh, if, uh, among Mesolithic people who had no farming and um, no states. So uh, what I'm getting at is that cultural evolution needs to be understood as part of evolution and cultural history needs to be understood in that context too. And the two are not incompatible just under, theor under theorized and understudied. And, you know, we've got to stop doing fisticuffs in order to prove that our side is right in everything. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the people who are doing evolutionary theory are trying very hard to understand the same things we are. I, I think there's, I, I may compliment this because it's related to, to how I try to design what the research group is doing in essence as a, as a sort of foundation. and. Um, there is hesitance um, against this uh, cultural evolution, the oh. cultural evolution society, which is biologists who sort of follow up. They have slightly different ideas than Dawkins about memes, but the idea is to have, you know, variation selection uh, in a very Darwinian sense as the core principle of culture. And so the other half of that crowd actually does uh, evolutionary psychology, where you, you really look at granular how does a ch child copy, say, an Eiffel Tower with spaghetti and, and, and some plastics? But the key thing is that um, that is not how artifactual history works. That's not how cultural history works, because the leading figure we have is not the phylogenetic tree. The leading figure we have is an older concept of, of, of uh, sort of cultural history, uh, which is the similarity matrix, the confusion matrix. How, how does stuff fit together? We know insanely more two orders of magnitude, maybe even more, about these kind of similarities than we do know about direct dependence. That's the reason why you find matrices of comparison of similarities without the dependence yet in archaeology books all the way back to Pitts in 1905. And so that is, that is a very important kind of thing. But that does not mean we have to give up. There's certainly some evolution happen. There's certainly, at the granular level, dependence happening. And as John said, this may not be deterministic, but there may be more determinism than we may be comfortable with. Uh, while at the same time in other places, it may not, these determinisms may not be as general as somebody who wants to have an evolutionary model um, uh, may be comfortable with. There is lots of, there's many, many sources of uncertainty going on. So- Can I just say, I, I completely agree if what Miller is trying to say is that there are models of evolution that- yes towards the confirmation of current prejudices, you know, like sex role stereotyping, for example. Yeah. It's just bloody nonsense. Yeah. Throw it away. 
it's not evolutionary theory at all. It's just ideology. And so here is a culture led version of evolution, which doesn't understand culture. So I think this is why we're needed so <laughs> to fix all that. So Göbekli Tepe, this 12,000 year old site in Turkey, which everybody should know, uh, not only is probably the source of all the variation of the myths of you, you find later in Gilgamesh and, 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 and so on, all the way up to, you know, mangas right now and the Marvel Universe. But at the same time, we actually have evidence that this particular point in time was the start of the agricultural evolution um, because the, 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 the species right. of wheat where the, the, the sort of grains can easily break off and you can start agriculture way more efficiently is actually that species is actually that shift is found 30 kilometers from Kublai Tepe. So the key thing is these kind of like more deterministic proper kind of uh, things of evolution where you have some tiny change and from there some a lot follows while at the same time a kind of more mushy kind of cultural evolution, there's many things possible and lots of mixture and lots of horizontal mean transfer and whatever. That all is possible at the same time. So I, this is, I'm, I'm only saying all this because I think there is a grand summary possible with what we heard today with um, basically what is out there. And there is many uh, too narrow ideas about this. So your reservations as a cultural historian are justified, while at the same time, there is a lot of biology that has happened since these kind of more stereotypical, narrow-minded approaches to evolution have been put into the discussion. So there is now Hi. two things in the chat. Um, so Mark Metz, you want to ask a question yourself? Oh yeah, sure. So thank you. Yeah, uh, not just for the comment, but what to begin with when when uh, John Hartley said that. Uh, first thing uh, we need to do is like humanity should should unite as one so i mean like what what do you what do you see this this unit of humanity so is it like uh, does it offer exactly this critical view as you have stressed now and and does this uh, well i think this question is actually answered <laughs> that that humanity offers this critical view and it kind of um, competes with perhaps more behavior behavioristic views and for example like the individual collectivism sense it it can uh, offer to the uh, cross-cultural psychology uh, the critical part so they they do some sort of description etc but there's this big critical humanities approach that is missing i think the humanities have historically uh, been uh, better at conceptualizing collectivities, communities, and cultures than have the sciences. And there's good reasons for that. I'm not suggesting anybody's done anything wrong. Uh, but uh, I think that the uh, market fundamentalism and the libertarian individualism that cu currently governs a great deal of uh, practical corporate and political activity uh, in the old democracies uh, and some of the new ones too, uh, is it needs contesting in the name of collectivities. We need to understand how groups operate and how systems interact and how new things uh, are produced, not by individual inventors and property relations, but by populations working together to solve a problem over a period of time. To, to, to continue that, to see, well, to me, it seems pretty visible that it's like part of a sort of a network turn. Do, do you agree with it yourself? That it's more network perspective and you can identify with it? I guess I, I guess I should do the same thing as I tried to do with Miller. I think in some ways networks are really, uh, you know, a liberating idea. I think there are such, such things as networks, including very small networks and very large networks, and they can be mathematically modeled. Uh, Paul Omerod's work on uh, small world networks is very interesting. And uh, so I'm, I, I welcome networks, but I don't necessarily want to uh, join a particular gang and say, well, actor network theory is what we should be doing. And uh, because that strikes me as another version of structuralism, to be honest. And so uh, uh, I, I think one has to be cautious, but, but interested in how these things develop and what value they may serve. Uh, I've often said as a media studies person that the biggest invention uh, of the internet was the user because uh, I was brought up in the broadcast era and my early media studies was all about 
um, state-based and corporate-based broadcasting, commercial and, co and state corporate uh, <laughs> broadcasting, which was a one-to-many or a centre-to-periphery kind of uh, model. And uh, the internet produces a completely different model of relations among uh, uh, you know, mediated entities uh, in which the user plays a much more prominent role, not just as a consumer, but also as a producer and a, 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 you know, a, a creator in their own right in some circumstances, but a little bit less circumscribed. And all of that is very different from what was even possible to think about when you had in America and um, you know state broadcasters in Britain and Europe so I think the uh, uh, you know I think the, the changes in technology do need to be taken seriously but we need to hang on to why it is that we want to study them and what it's for it, it reminds also the question of how age idea of agencies are changing but yes. but perhaps others have also questions so yes. I will... there is two more questions in the chat, which are both interesting, and we got seven minutes left. Left, so um, let's um, get to them. So the first is Antonina, and the second one is Andres Conno. Antonina. Uh, yes, thank you for a very interesting conversation. Uh, I'm just uh, very, I'm very interested in the question of uh, cultural forecast. And uh, recently, with Indrek on seminars, we discussed the latest uh, Lefanovich book where he uh, um, points out that cultural forecast also has some uh, dangers because uh, if you uh, it was first be used from some people, individuals or a group for personal profit. And for example, right now we have, we have companies that forecast what's going to happen in fashion. And um, also it's very important because uh, for the forecasting culture, we can also, we can influence the cultural flow. So what do you think about it? Should we as the researchers uh, dig into that, how we can uh, make it safer for society? Or is it all right to influence culture? Should we be, uh, should, should, should just the question, should researchers be observers and look at the culture like from, from some vantage point or should, or should we just dive into that? <laughs> use data, give it back to society. So what's your, what's your take on this? Well, if I may start answering, um, cultural semiotics as an approach is an interesting one because it kind of states explicitly that, that scholarly or academia is also part of culture. So all the models in Lothmanian terms, the models of culture that we produce and forecasting is, is effectively another modeling process. Um, that we influence culture, but it's also, it's fine. It's unavoidable, yeah? You cannot, you cannot be in culture without taking part of it. Um, and then the question is what kind of models are being produced? And if one of the ideas is that uh, diversity is good for culture's health in a way, culture's readiness to react to its risks, then the you know, research aim or the modeling purpose would be to which should be the diversification, produce the models that improve the culture's health in terms of its readiness to react to its risks, which, you know, Anthropocene currently presents us uh, plenty. So if I don't know, this, this was my answer. There's a very small part I would want to add, nothing much, because uh, anyway, uh, it is that uh, the idea of cultural forecasting in relation to a systems model would be different from the idea of prediction based on linear science of a, a kind of a mechanical model. And I think that's a difference that we should explore much more carefully. Yes. Mario. I don't have much to add right now. Okay, that's good. Uh, yes, I, I would like to um, also underscore what John uh, just said. There's another interesting thing in the past, trend forecasting has often been an, uh, and still is a qualitative affair, which means it's exactly not what John is talking and, and Indrik are talking about, um, but it's basically design. So one of the um, most outstanding trend forecasters right now, based on how much is paid, would be Lee Edelcourt. She's a designer, so she designs trends. If she says, oh, copper is an upcoming, upcoming thing, it's not just an observation of a system, it's when she says copper, there's so many bandwagon effects that people basically just do copper everything. 
from sneakers to, as you know, you've seen that, for example. So that is a very important thing that we have to be very careful about this. Also with the people who say, oh, you know, we were all gonna end up in a new monarchy or in a new kind of dictatorship. There's no way around it because technology will do this or um, um, intel artificial intelligence will take over. It cannot be avoided. That is a design act. And it's just something where we haven't analyzed the system well enough and made the decision as humanity, as a unit to say, do we really want this? Maybe we don't. And we decide against it, just like we can decide against having nuclear warheads. And then the question is, what kind of mechanisms to be put in place that other people don't have them too? So that is a that is a really important thing, and that's how what we do here is not a hobby horse. Um, Andres Conn. So it wasn't a question; it's more like a comment. I was just listening to what Mara said about uh, inter intersemiotics, right? And um, I just uh, and and uh, Roman Jakobson and I, I just uh, yeah your thoughts starts to go around uh, the concepts and and names and it just occurred to me that uh, this uh, this sphere metaphor is quite an old already it's not just a semisphere but it's it started with this Vernadsky's nosphere and then there is a. Uh, this whole whole the history of uh, you know Lev Gumilyovs and uh, Nikolai Trubetskoy and uh, Roman Jakobson himself uh, they they started this uh, uh, evolution of Russian culture and all this uh, Tartar school of semiotics uh, which is also about uh, the uh, the history of Russian culture they kind of compared it to the organic development of of an organism so it's uh, the metaphor of sphere like biosphere we're living together in it and uh, we we need to, to can take into account all the variables that uh, that can should be taken into account so uh, yeah i think it's very interesting book to read so i'm just looking forward to it so. can i just say that we do have a fairly extensive section on vanadsky uh, and the mm. concept of the biosphere partly to rescue Vanadsky from um, you know, Western presumptions about where the idea of the biosphere came from, uh, because most people don't read um, uh, Vanadsky. Uh, but also because there's a, um, a continuity between Vanadsky and Lotman that is well known by Lotmanians. And uh, uh, it, it suggests that communication studies has neglected for too long uh, the relationship between communication and the biosphere uh, and that there is a, a kind of research object for com for the whole communication field to get away from individualistic psychology and towards understanding uh, uh, communication semiosis as uh, you know a defining property of life if it is uh, and to see how that works into semiotically species and uh, interculturally uh, and so I think the, you know, the kind of the germ from Vanadsky is incredibly important and much. Thank important. you very much. Uh, we have one minute over time. So Mar, sorry, next time. <laughs> um, I, this is, this is great. Um, we're going to continue on this journey, including the last minute that uh, there needs to be overlap between um, the two scientific worlds that have been separate for so long. And in the West, there's lots of stuff we have to catch up on in terms of what was going on in Russia. Um, that is um, very much true. Um, and so uh, I hope we all um, um, use this as the start of something big. Um, and basically with that, I would uh, like to wish you a happy Easter, which is coming up. So next week there is Easter Monday. And then we have a string uh, of uh, Open the webinars, which we're going to announce. Uh, we'll basically fill up until the end um, of the semester. So thank you very much, Hendrik. Uh, um, see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you.